Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senator Hutchinson, Senator Bozeman, thank you for your attention here. I, I want to just preface this by saying uh, I, I was born the same week that NASA was founded. And while that specific point is of little rel relevance to the words of my testimony, I would say it's of great relevance to the feeling with which I deliver these words, having the same lifespan. Uh, I want to start off with a quote from a famous aviator, French aviator, Antoine saint exupéry This quote may be known to some of you, but I think it bears repeating often. If you want to build a ship, don't drum up people to collect wood, and don't assign them tasks and work, but rather teach them to long for the endless immensity of the sea. So that's a point of view that will matter for what follows here. Right now, NASA's Mars science exploration budget is being decimated. We're not going back to the moon. Plans for astronauts to visit Mars or anywhere beyond low Earth orbit are delayed until the 2030s on funding not yet allocated, overseen by a Congress and a president to be named later. When I think of our golden era of space exploration, the late 1950s right on up through the early 1970s, over that time, very few weeks would go by before there would be an article in a newspaper in a magazine <clears throat> where a cover story would extol the city of tomorrow, transportation of tomorrow, the home of tomorrow, even food of tomorrow. And in spite of this optimism, that was a decade that was perhaps almost turbulent in a century since the Civil War itself. We all felt threatened from the Cold War, total annihilation in fact, there was a hot war going on, losing 100 servicemen a week, the civil rights movement, assassinations, and the like. The landscape was poisoned that decade. Yet, one of the jewels in the American crown was our exploration of space. From what I can tell, the people who did the dreaming back then were the scientists, engineers, and technologists. And it's a community of people who are formally trained to discover. They are discoverers. And what inspired them? Ask them. Everyone to a person will tell you it was America's bold and visible investment in a space frontier. Now, I happen to know, and we all have had this experience, exploration of the unknown doesn't always make a priority for people. I can tell you, however, that audacious visions have the power to alter mind states, to change assumptions about what is possible. And when a nation allows itself to dream big, these dreams prevail in the citizens' ambitions. They energize the electorate. During the Apollo era, you didn't need government programs trying to convince people that doing science and engineering was good for the country. It was self-evident. And even those not formally trained in technical fields embraced what those fields meant to the collective national future. Remember, that was the climate that birthed the New York World's Fair, which was all about tomorrow, and the iconic Unisphere, which donned three rings, evoking the three orbits of John Glenn in the Mercury 7 capsule. During that age of space exploration, any jobs that went overseas were the kind nobody really wanted anyway. Those that stayed in this country were the consequence of persistent streams of innovation that could not be outsourced because other nations couldn't yet figure out how to do what it was we were doing. In fact, most of the world's nations stood awestruck by our accomplishments. Let's be honest, of course, over that period, we went to the moon because we were at war. It's not a secret. To think otherwise, though, in fact, is delusional. And it leads some people to suppose we got to the moon by 1969. Of course, we're going to be in Mars by 1980. No, not if you went to the moon because you were at war. You then establish that the Soviet Union is not also going to the moon. Everything ends. But that was with a cost. What is that cost? Well, yes, war can get you to go to the moon, get, even get you to go to Mars. But there's another driver that exists, another driver of great ambitions. And it's almost as potent as the need to protect your security. And that's the promise of wealth. Nobody wants to die, of course, but nobody wants to die poor. 
fully funded missions to Mars and anywhere beyond low Earth orbit, commanded by astronauts who today would be in middle school, would reboot America's capacity to innovate as no other force in society can. What matters here, in fact, are not spin-offs, although there are plenty of spin-offs that are fun to read about. NASA, every couple of years, puts out a document. NASA spin-offs, I recommend everyone here review that document if you haven't seen them. But beyond the spin-offs, what matters are the cultural shifts in how the electorate views the role of science and technology in our daily lives. Because as the 70s drew to a close, we stopped advancing a space frontier. The Tomorrow articles faded. And we spent the next several decades coasting on the innovations conceived by earlier dreamers. They knew that seemingly impossible things were possible. And others among them, those who saw what the previous generation had enabled, witnessed the Apollo voyages to the moon, even if, though they were not a participant. And this is the greatest adventure there ever was. Yet if all you do is coast, eventually you slow down while others catch up and pass you by. We've got symptoms in society today. We're going broke, we're mired in debt, we don't have as many scientists as we want or need, and jobs are going overseas. I assert that these are not isolated problems, that they're the collective consequence of the absence of ambition that consumes you when you stop having dreams. In the NASA portfolio, it's multidimensional. It taps the frontiers of biology, where we look for life on Mars, chemistry, physics, astrophysics, geology, atmospherics, electrical engineering, mechanical engineering. These are the classic subjects that are the foundation of the STEM fields. Science, of course, science, technology, engineering, and math, and they are all represented in the NASA portfolio. Epic space adventures, adventures plant seeds of economic growth because doing what's never been done before is intellectually seductive, whether or not we deem it practical. And when you conduct those exercises, innovation follows just as day follows night. And when you innovate, you lead the world, you keep your jobs, and concerns over tariffs and trade regulations evaporate. The call for this adventure would echo loudly across society and down the educational pipeline. At what cost? The spending portfolio of the United States currently allocates 50 times as much money to social programs and education than it does NASA. So the old argument, why are we spending money up there and not down here? We are spending money down here. To the credit of the lawmakers understanding where priorities need to land. Consider, however, that the half a penny budget that NASA receives, if you double it, twice that, as unthinkable that is to so many, I assert that we can transform the country from a sullen, dispirited nation, weary of economic struggle, to one where it has reclaimed its 20th century birthright to dream of tomorrow. And I ask you, how much would you pay to launch our economy. And from my scientific heart, I ask, how much would you pay for the universe? A slightly longer version of these notes have been submitted for the record.